So now before I head to Chicago, I'm going to stop in at St. Charles, Missouri to meet up with my friend Mark Wilson. And I've known Mark since I was just starting pool in Moline, Illinois. And he's always been one of the true gentlemen of the sport. And Mark currently coaches a billiards team at Lindenwood University, which is where I met up with him. We request that you maintain a 3.0 GPA, which is, you know, that's pretty strong in school. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you got to work. And I help them. I have tutors on staff. And uh, if you're having your parents are splitting up and you have psychological problems, I got guidance counselors and counselors and mental, you know, I mean, so there's really no reason to wash out once you get here. And uh, we work hard, but we have a lot of fun. And we do things, when well, last year we took a trip to a VA hospital where we played a match just because those guys sacrificed for our country. Right. And oftentimes they're, they get decent health care and decent uh, housing, but no one ever, I mean, there are no families that come visit, and they're the loneliest guys you've ever seen. They're so thrilled. So I always take, you know, like my young, vibrant, right. they, they draw life off of these kids, you know, and they get a kick out of it, and then I let them play and interact too, and we have a match there. But we want to do a lot of benevolent, benevolent acts right. like that to kind of put the sport in the right light. So, and this is, is also very much going to be a reflection on the Moscone Cup team, right. is that those same core values will hold true. It doesn't matter, I don't care if you run 500 balls, you're not going to be on this year's Moscone Cup team if you don't have honor, integrity, and respect. But that's one thing with the European teams, they seem to have that, right? That unity, the discipline. I, I, I really think part of it comes at their approach. We always come at it in America, and I'm saying it generically, but I'm just saying, oh, you play tour, how much you win? Oh, just $40, that was it, oh, okay. It's like it's not even, you know, it's more about the money, not about the sport, not about, like, I, I would just like to beat you for the sake of beating you and say I played good, you know, not uh, how much did you win, you know, it's always money, 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 and many of the guys that are good players today, if the money was in tiddlywinks, then they just practice tiddlywinks every day, they don't really even care what game, they don't have that drive and passion, you know, for it, and so, uh, anyway, that's, that's kind of, they were the Europeans, they, they don't look at it as an income thing, they look at it as a sport first and then the money will follow if we make it a sport, you know. And right, it's that respect for the sport, right, first and foremost. So is that going to be difficult, working with the American team, trying to do that? No, I guess, but it's, it's kind of a twofold no because the, the, the yes part of it, the yes part of it. They never had any leadership. They just look up to the previous generation, which is oftentimes the wrong people, to, even though they were skilled players, didn't really lead that way, you know. And so, yes, because they're so indoctrinated into that mindset, it's going to be tough. But the fact that they're all broke, and I say, here's the path we're going to follow. But no, I'm just saying, you know, I'm not jumping. I mean, there's no money in it. So if we want to, we can't persist in what we've done for 40 years, because I've watched it. it. We have got nowhere to work. Nowhere. And so we're going to have to change directions here. And so in that regard, it might be hard for them to change direction. But on the other hand, I think they might be open to it because they know they're not doing too good. I mean, there's no denying that. You know, it's, it's kind of the same way I got the Moscone Cup job was the fact that uh, we have did so poorly over the last eight years. Yeah. The U.S. is exactly 100 racks behind the Europeans in eight years. That's a heck of a beating. Don't tell me bad roles. I don't even want to dream of being that many bad roles, you know. But but we're oftentimes, you know, excuse makers. Not really me. It's uh, got some bad roles, and the crowd was hostile. And the referee walked in front of my shot. It's never me, actually. It's not that I didn't practice, you know. So we're going to get down to work ethic and uh, and uh, understanding uh, what respect for the sport. You, know, if you and I don't respect it, or my players can't. Really how can I ask somebody else to pay money to respect it? You know, I mean, how can you even? Yeah, right. so, so that's... So these are going to be like certain guidelines when they first come in as part of your team. And what happens to the other like penalties? Do they break any of the rules? Yeah, yeah, much like here. If you, if you break one of these, if you go on campus and you do something that causes a scene or a disturbance and it's a reflection on the players' team, and so it was a once and done in, in the report, you know, and, and if I have to do it again, and if I have to get all eight new players for the Moscow Nine Cup, I would be willing to do that. I don't think I do. I think I selected people to have an understanding of what I'm saying, but 
nice words is one thing, actions is quite another, you know, and so we're going to find out. Right. You know, we are going to find out, and you're gonna, that's how you're going to earn the final five spots, and if I have to bring in new people. Uh, Has any leader ever done that with the Moscone Cup no. team, saying, do it this way or you're out? No, but the, in fairness, they never had a chance. Mm -hmm. What happened was, after the U.S. Open, which is usually October, then they would name one player per week to the U.S. team. And then it was like a big, hey, oh, Tor Lowry, and now this week, oh, it's Mark Wilson too, and then who's next? We don't know, you know, and try to generate some PR, you know. And then after the team was selected, based oftentimes on their results, or perhaps in some cases on their marketability for television, they put together a team that they thought would be, you know, the highest skill levels. And then they would name the coach with literally just a few weeks to go before the match. And so it was just more of a figurehead position, just kind of a nice thing, sound cool, like you got a coach, you know. But, but it never meant anything because players were all over the United States and there was never any time to really do anything. Last year's team behaved so poorly after 20 years that the matchroom who puts this on changed the wholesale the way, they, the way they do business. They used to select the players and have the criteria. This year, they, 30 days later, here's a new coach, it's all on you. No, that's how bad it had to be. And, uh, you know, poor behavior, disrespectful, uh, all the things I was just describing. All the things that the sign is not about, you know? And, and so, uh, that's kind of how it led to this, and that's why you can't really fault anyone for failure they never really had a chance and oftentimes didn't even have the mental capacity to do something if they did have a chance. So when I was appointed as the Cup captain, it quickly became a thing where you know, it was a great honor and then with it came you know, a great deal of responsibility because I feel that to the American Billiard public to put forth a, a product that they can be proud of and that's disciplined and professional because I've always been willing to say, why didn't this happen? Who didn't do this? And this is, the game's not any better. It's, it's somebody's fault. Well, now I got a position and I thought, you know what? I don't give a damn if I don't sleep for 10 months. <laughs> no, really, mm -hmm. because I may never get this and I don't owe anybody anything. I don't have to, like usually when you get something that's a plum position, Usually you say, well, this outfit that got me the job, they want so-and-so on the team, and I really don't want them, but I kind of owe it to them. I don't owe anybody. Yeah, I can put whoever on. You know, I can put myself on, me and Paul, play this match. You know? And so uh, that I really like, but the other part of it is that I don't want to squander this. And so that's why I've been up since 6 this morning and virtually every day, and I go to bed working on it every day, seven days a week. Seriously. So you're you're uh, creating a game plan. Basically. Oh, huge game plan, yeah. yeah. Huge game plan. You, you want to hear about it? Yeah. Um, number one, uh, the, the two main fronts for this was, number one, we want to win the Moscone Cup. And that's been uh, because the, the Americans have did so poorly, the matchroom is sensitive to the fact that it's starting to look it's like it's spiraling out of control. Last year we lost 11-2. to two. And the two games we won were six to five and six to five. So theoretically, we could have lost eleven to nothing with two different racks of nine ball. Now that being said, they also won some six to five too. So you know, but I'm just saying, eleven to two is such a well. They lost a day and a third of live TV programming to, programming to Europe and Asia. Oh yeah. Well, you know what that means. You know, I mean, that's not good at all. But that can happen with live sport. But then the attitude that went with it, and to include. Like, even some of the players didn't seem to be into it and were willing to use profanity uh, um, on TV and it's live and repetitively. And the people in the audience felt like, why am I paying to come here and watch this? It's so poor. Yeah, I mean, what are they doing? So, uh, anyway, so we want to recapture that we, anyway, Matthew wants us to win the Moscone Cup, you know, but they're not going to shape it for us to win, but they're giving us every chance to do mm -hmm. present a better product. And two, we want to kind of reinvigorate or re-engage the American Billiards community. So those are like our two-pronged things. Mm -hmm. And so I've devised a plan to try to accomplish both goals. One, it starts um, soon, literally May 22nd, where the, see, the whole team has not even had a chance to meet yet. And that's really not the way I wanted to start this off. But anyway, we want to get the whole team on board so everybody gets the same message, the same information, the same understanding of what the plan is, okay? 
And so this is coming up in just literally 16 days, our, our first meeting. It's a big undertaking, the logistics and everything to get to, to this, even to this point with the budget and everything. But we got it. Okay, so we're, we're forging forward. And originally, we were going to try to do a West Coast tour, a Midwest tour, and an East Coast tour as a part of our training. And this was to be, um, we were going to go from San Diego to L.A., San Francisco, uh, Portland, Spokane, on a West Coast swing. And we'd go to a pool room, and we'd spend two days. And there, we would, the first thing we'd do, they would come there, is a charitable endeavor, such as underprivileged kids, or elderly housing, or something, just to be good folks, you know, or a VA hospital. And to kind of put the right... Uh, direction on the sport and hopefully to engage some of the local media so I can get my players in front of this because when you go to England the media coverage is unbelievable. You know, you'll, be, you'll be on four different TV channels per day, two radio stations, and five newspapers every day. Wow. Yeah, no, it's huge. And, and if you're not used to bright light shining in your eyes and people asking you questions and how you can respond. So I kind of want to get them a little bit more media savvy, I would say. And just kind of, and this is, helps to sort out who would be the most qualified people to go and represent us too. And so we were going to do this charitable thing. Then that night, we're going to the local pool room where we've organized a proper Moscone Cup match. Same style, same rules, shot clock, scoring, scotch doubles, all you know, sundry various things that go with it. Just to get my players familiar with playing under these uh, circumstances, because some of my new players here that I selected haven't played like this a lot. You don't practice a lot of scotch doubles. We're normally uh, renegades that, you know, I'm normally trying to beat you to make a living for me, you know. Now all of a sudden we're going to be pals and teammates and we can't go over there with such a hostile kind of a soccer hooligan crowd that's really raucous. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but I mean, like they'll yell on your backswing and pelt you with jelly beans and stuff. I mean, anything that will happen. And, but they're passionate, you know, it's, it's a really cool thing, but it's also, you, if you're willing to be scared at all, this will absolutely terrify you, you know what I mean? And then the lights of TV, and God don't blink, your suitcase got you, you know what I mean? Don't even think about blinking. So I gotta have my guys up to speed on, I don't know what I'm saying, let's see, Scott, uh, is it your shot? Uh, no, or, no, I think, yeah, it was you. You know, I want them kind of familiar with that part of it so they can play that. And we've got some other things that we're going to do so that they can deal with all the other inputs that they're getting rather than still the format, too. You know, just blow you out of the water. And I played in a couple of them, so I'm a little bit aware of how it is. But I'm sure it's intensified since then because that was 20 years ago. And so uh, that's why these matches were going to be like this. We're going to play matches all along there with the best five players they can get. We don't care. Then, the next day we're coming back to the guy's pool room and we're going to do a proper clinic in there and then you'd be able to play some of the players as a, as a customer challenge games against some of the Hope Moscone Cup hopefuls and so that would kind of be like a little windfall for the pool room and then and maybe we could make it where it kind of benefits both and, and then it gets uh, the American Billiard Republic kind of excited like oh wow I hope he makes it I really like this guy and he showed me something about you know whatever safeties or something that was interesting and then some of the uh, training things that we do is pretty interesting too. So we were going to go along there, but the budget shortfall precluded us from being able to do it. And now we're starting to get late into the game, even though we're six months away. It's still late into the game for organizing all this and the logistics. And it's, it's way harder than I thought it might be. But the plan was basically good. So then I thought, well, hmm. Things are not shaping up like I hope, so good leadership is to have contingency plan and then another contingency plan. So we went to contingency plan B, which is we're going to still salvage our March, May 22nd through the 26th, so we get one good start. And plus, I want to bring my players up to speed on conducting the clinic, looking prepared and professional and polished, not like it's herding cats and I don't know, he told me to say something about safety or something, you know. So we want it to look smooth, you know, make it. So everybody's happy, you know, make it a, it's going to be fun. And then uh, we're doing that. And then we're coming here June 18th as a team. And then we're going to train here in this facility. Linda would say I can have carte blanche to use the facility. And this is the exact tables and the exact, now it's quiet, they're seven foot all the way around. You know, I mean, Nick Barner came here like, you guys get to train like this all the time. You get a kid, you know. And, and so it's really cool that way. And so uh, we will base ourselves out of here, and then we can still resurrect the Midwest tour a bit. So we got three or four stops. 
where we will take a van from here, and then you know Midwestern expenses are cheaper too, and so it, it's a little bit more cost effective first year out to do this. And we were going to do two or three stops, two days each, and then we're going to wind up at the Billiards Summit, which is the formerly the Billiards Trade Show in Louisville, and try to re-engage some of the manufacturers that are a bit put off with American pool players in the past. So we got a booth and a table, and I'm going to have my players go to some of their booths and engage their customers and be you know presentable and carry the message. And the, and the primary message that we intend to deliver there is that we're not selling anything other than the sport but a uh, big sales pitch on the sport, which is the Pool Awareness Week. And this will be held November 2nd through the 9th. And I've always been one that when I heard this idea, it's like, ah, every, every week it's on the dog awareness and diabetes awareness and eye care awareness and you know, I mean, all these different things. And you just become immune to it, you know. But then the genius of it started to dawn on me that to proliferate the sport and get people back into it, we have to have a way. So Pool Awareness Week, all we ask is everybody that's either a player, a room owner, manufacturer, uh, instructor, to engage one brand new person in the sport that week. Bring them to your league match, show them how to draw something, take them to the pool room, tell them about a pro tournament, just something. You know, I mean, just bring one new person. And if, if we all continue to do this every year during that week, in four or five years, we will have a little growth. And maybe that week, the pool room owner who operates on slim margins might receive a little 15, 20% burst in success. You know what I mean? And not everybody will stay in the sport, but we got we have to start nurturing the sport rather than we normally eat our young mm -hmm. and run them off, you know? And so, so that part of it's, you know, that's that's the big thing with pool awareness week. It'll just be, it doesn't really cost anything except that you can't be apathetic. Doesn't cost you any money, you know. You can even go on a website and just download posters if you want to put them, put them up and talk it up. You know, I mean, and it, we all benefit the greatest from it, you know, because we already have stature in the right. sport. But if we if we doubled the pool of pool players, then we're twice as high, you know. I mean, and, and the pool owners and Q sales and leagues are filling up. I mean, it, there's nothing bad from this that can possibly happen, you know. And because you can't really go around like one of the other big things with the team, Moscone Cup team is that I can't tell you how many times I've had people graciously offer me money to support the adventure. And I appreciate their generosity like you cannot believe, Tor. But we're not doing business like that anymore. We're not going around begging. If this ain't self-sustained, then it's, it's not a sport. It, and we did the other thing for 40 years, and then next year I can come back with my hand out. Would you give us another 500? You were a good guy last year. Would you do it again? No. So I, to that extent, I hired a sports marketing agent to sell Team USA and then uh, in lieu of uh, they'll get a name on the shirt even for the live TV which if you're interested in the European and Asian markets that would have some value mm -hmm. but also domestically here when we go to all these events that we're going to go to and everything that we do and then all the literature and all the websites even the matching website would be you know zero X or whatever it would be you know preferably outside the industry though really had a couple other ones in mind. So the third and final objective besides the Midwest Tour and the kickoff is the wind-up. And in October we'll cut it to five players, at which point, uh, right the week before we go to England, I'm having all brand new Simonas put on each of these tables. And we're just going to train here as a team that whole week. And then we're going to go over there three days early and kind of get acclimated and everything. And then so we just been playing on super slick. And plus, these are brand new pro-ams that are the same table that we'll be using with the same cloth and the same everything else. So what happens if it's maybe uh, three weeks before you're set to start, and maybe one of the players gets a little, breaks one of the rules? Well, I can still, you can still, yeah, I can, I can still switch thing. them out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, there's a, this is something that never happened before. The question in the past has been, what if you get sick in the middle of this thing? Right. Now what are we going to do? And so always in the past, they would rearrange the, like, you might just play four-handed, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't have to forfeit. But, you know, instead of, normally they make it so we all play equal to make oh. it fair. But in this case, you know, we would just kind of run through. But I, and just in case, I'm getting a stroke. If I have to put myself in, I will.
No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds cool. Oh, that'd be cool. <laughs> the coach has come out. He's putting himself <laughs> in. <laughs> well, I was explaining to him how we're going to have honesty is going to be a big part of our policy and no excuses. We accept no excuse. You're responsible. You're culpable. You just have to man up and own it. You know? and, and I don't criticize people for missing. I will criticize you for using poor technique. Or I would definitely criticize you for poor attitude. You know, I mean, that, that won't be tolerated. So that's part of the parameters of the first meeting is to further lay it out, even though they've all heard the guidelines. I want them all together rather than individually. Say, so, well, you're going to really pull me out of that way. You know? So I want everybody, because they're, they're going to be leaders of the sport. And even though I'm named the captain, this is not my team. And it's not even their team. It's everybody that's passionate about the sport. Mm -hmm. Should feel included, welcome to contribute, to ask. I want a real transparent process of how things got the way they are. Oh, and I want everyone that likes the sport to feel like, hey, this could be really cool, you know, and kind of be, you know, further drawn in rather than always just to be kind of surreptitious and like, I don't know, you know, it was his friend and that's what he did, you know, or, or something kind of like there's always some kind of misunderstanding. I want to be open, you know. So. And uh, because I would just like to be, I just like to treat people the way I would like to be treated, you know. And I'm curious and want to know, so we try to include them. So we're going to have a Facebook page, team Facebook page, yeah. And we, we currently have a private Facebook page, you know, that's ongoing, so that the team can interact really easily. And uh, during the interviews, you know, I'd say so, um, you know, we're going to have honesty, you know. And I, I'm a poker player, so I kind of try to get a little read on them because you know they're not that. <laughs> you know, deceptive, you know, so, and they go, oh, okay, you know, and then I said, so, uh, in, in terms of honesty, you know, I mean, uh, I guess I'll start off, I, I want you to criticize my appointment as the Moscone Cup captain, I want you to negatively criticize it, so, right away, you, most of these guys are so desperate, they, oh, no, 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 uh, actually, I always said you'd be the right guy, you know, I mean, uh, of course, you know, I mean, that's just the way it is, right, and so I go, because they're you know real gracious and, and um, I said oh Tor Lowry pussy okay got that <laughs> and then then that usually shocks them and I can get a read on their face so then I say well how about this how about the fact that I didn't win any world championships how about that and they go well yeah I guess that's true you know kind of yeah I, I kind of thought about it but I didn't know you know and because I really rather address it because when they go back to their own pool rooms, people are going to say, well, who is this guy and why does he think he knows anything about it? You know, or whatever. I'd rather just, rather than have to suppress it for them, I'd rather they just feel comfortable to talk about it. I'm comfortable with it. You know, I mean, I wish I had, but I didn't. And so that's the fact of the matter. And so, uh, but, you know, I will own that. And no problem. And so by me taking ownership of that and discussing it, uh, but the reality of it is not about my world championships or lack of. It's actually more about your world championships because you're playing. But you don't have any. So perhaps we better dismiss that altogether because if it's about world championships, you mean I have to dredge up, you know, Mike Siegel and Buddy Hall because they actually have world championships, you know. And so do I have to get them out or maybe it's more about what we do for the next six months. Maybe that's really what we should make it about. Right. And so, but then now we've kind of opened up the flow of communication here a little bit, you know, because I've been like, you know, criticize me, I don't care, you know, it's okay. And then, you know, we can discuss things like, uh, I kind of further try to engage them with, rather than saying about how the European team trains differently than we do, and respects the sport differently, uh, we, will, we will start up like this, why don't you tell me something bad about Ralph Suquet? Or Darren Appleton, you know, mm -hmm. and they oftentimes are perplexed and hard pressed. I mean, you know, but you know, I guess he hates missing balls or something. You know, I mean, they can't even think of really anything because he's professional and trains hard and all the good things of the sport that I love. And so, rather than me say, "Why don't you be like him?" You know, and I don't really want to put them up on a pedestal either. Right. But also, hey, maybe let's get a clue here. They train like athletes, and they work out, and they study the game, and they break down video, and they they're talking about different little techniques, and we're worried about who won 400. You know, right. some petty crap that not really going to help the sport. You know, and so and they keep their emotions in check. Yeah, that's what they need. Totally. Do. Oh yeah, yeah. That, that's something very important. Yeah, and it's. It, it's important for the, uh, I don't want all clones, it's not like that, but I do want people that understand that, uh, this is the perfect example, so I just bought this video yesterday because I want the team to see it. At this year's Derby City, Ralph Suquet was playing Carlo Beato, a 10 ball match on 10 foot tables. 
And Carlo won the leg, broke and ran out the first break of ten ball. Super tight pockets too. Then Carlo makes a ball on the break and plays a killer safety on Ralph. And so this is Ralph's one time to the table, nothing. He has to kick for his life, his dear life. He kicks and hits it and sells out. Yeah, I mean, the guy runs out. It wasn't a really easy run out because a 10-foot table with small pockets, but I'm just saying, the guy's playing that good, runs out. Then follows it up with two more break and run outs. For nothing, Ralph has kicked one ball. Then, for seven straight innings, Ralph comes to the table either kicking or the one ball's on that end rail and the key ball's on this end rail, and you've got to play safe for your life. And Ralph is completely composed. Every shot, you, if you looked at him, you could not tell he's not winning or, or is winning. You can't tell. And every shot he played it as perfect as he could. And he moused around there for a little while. He didn't get frustrated. Totally patient. Finally, he got a crack of light on the one ball. It was a tough shot. Thin cut. He hadn't had a shot for, I don't know, 20 innings. Boom. Cuts it in. Runs out. Goes on. Wins the match. 11-7. to seven. But Beato never made any mistakes. And Ralph never flinched one bit, like it's all in the plan. He just sat there, just took every safety, every tough shot, just went there, 100% effort, just sat back down, not even flustered. 11 7, after losing 4 nothing with no shots and seven innings of safety, you don't see this because it's planned for in his game plan. He's used to the tactical side of the game. When you're playing great players, you don't get good, nice shots. That's, that's your start point. End rail, end rail. There it is. And so, we're definitely going to include that in training, and we're definitely going to include that because that's the one side. We break good, we run out okay, we're good there, and we're not going to get wildly better between now and December, but we can get a lot better here with yeah. the structures. And, that, and that's really, that's the one thing that we can recover pretty quickly. And so we definitely want to work on the tactical side of the game. Last year, because of the way they racked the balls and the breaking rules, the breaker won exactly 39% of the games. So the breaker's the underdog, significant. And so, which means there's going to be a lot of tactical games in there, you know. So, th so this type of thing I'm describing is going to be a huge thing. But it's not a glamorous thing to practice. Nobody does that. Nobody practices. They like start firing balls in from every angle, right. make some jump shots, you know. I mean, right. look great. You know, you don't go down there and say, "Oh my God, Mark's bunting the one ball again, four hours straight." He's just been, right. what is he thinking? You know, I mean. But, but we're going to have to if you want to keep up with what you're facing. You know, that's just pro pool in this day and age. Just kind of reduced to a mark form rather than random chance. And so um, you can't just rely on shot making and, and performance. That has nothing, you know, very little to do with it. And so uh, those type things are brought to their attention. You know, and and and, and then even like the, when we have the players come here beyond the interview, and they, you know, we have a nice chat about some of the other aspects of the game and what they thought they brought to the team, what I thought they brought to the team. And then when they come here, we do, um, number one, I have a real sophisticated radar gun that reads a tenth of a mile per hour. And so, because the, the difference, like say you break, and say you break at 18. Well, I used to have a gun that just read flat miles per hour. Then you hit the next one, just crush it by se you know, seemingly, and it would still read 18. I'm like, I could swore you hit it harder. But the tenth of a mile an hour is a big difference at mm -hmm. those speeds. And so 18.1 to 18.9 is a big difference. So we, we, we go through a series of breaks and we re, uh, record the speeds for each individual player. But then we also assign a value to the degree of cue ball control. You know? And so um, naturally, if a cue ball gets kissed, it doesn't count. You know? But we're just saying, could you kind of center up the cue ball pretty good? You know? Or is it going up and down the table or off to the side? No, you're not hitting it. So we just, it's just percentage, half the time, you know, or 60% of the time you have pretty good, good cue ball control, and then here's where your speeds, how they vary. And then uh, we do a video analysis uh, simultaneously with a golf swing application that's very sophisticated and really cool. It really allows you to break it down and blow up different portions of slow-mo, frame by frame, and instant replay, no, it's way cool. And then we do a thing like, uh, the next thing is we do uh, stop shots. And we put the cue ball on the head string, and we put an object ball straight into the corner pocket on the foot string. So each one's two diamonds out of the corner pocket. You, you follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then we do a radar thing. How, how, what's your break, uh, stop shot speed? You have to stop the ball dead, and what's the lowest speed that you can hit it at? And to hit it at that lowest speed, you have to get down on the edge of the ball. Well, yeah. Right, super effective. So at that particular stop shot, I'm timed. So the pocket plays bigger. Way bigger. Yeah. Yeah, way bigger. So Efren hits his routinely at 6.6 .6 miles per hour. 
a standard league average would be 11 to 12 miles per hour. Well, Efren's pocket is almost twice as big, margin of error wise, you know, it yeah. effectively makes it bigger. Yeah. And so, at the end of the day, if his pocket's this big and yours is this big, you know for sure who wins. Even though you hit some, you, you even hit some in there, but I don't care. You know, you're working twice as hard to get less, you know, and, but you have to have a very refined stroke to do it. So this gives me the ability to actually generate which guy's stroke is real good, you know. And so anything 7.2 or lower is, is a very good speed. And so um, and anything that reaches double figures is not an adequate speed at all. You know, I mean, if you're in the even the upper sevens, uh, borderline, but anything about that is no, that's yeah. no good, not even close. And so, but that's, you know, that's the distinction. No one really thinks about that. And then we do a thing where we take a, put the cue ball right dead center of the table, and then the object ball straight in the corner pocket. And you're asked to use extreme side spin pocket the ball and then we use a stopwatch to time how long does the ball retain spin which once again gives us an idea of how hard and how accurate you can hit with an extreme you say well you never use that what's the point the point is this that when you become accustomed to pocketing the ball with that much power and spin you have to have a very refined stroke to have the accuracy but two it also gives us an idea of your humanship if you have the capacity to get it so Anything north of 15 seconds is pretty damn good. 20 seconds, real good. We have one that shot at 24.2 seconds. And I've heard of higher figures, but that's also you have to understand it's relative to the equipment you're doing it with, too. And so we normally have clean balls here. And we didn't do all the players yet, but that's one of the things that we're using that will be posted on the public Facebook page. So that it gives you something numerical to say, oh my God, look at this. Okay, I didn't. Stop shots? Wow, they're really, I never heard of this, you know, this is different, you know. Just to engage the billiards community in the, what's going on here. And then we do, we do some other things too, I'm trying to think of what all they were. I have a whole list of things. But, oh, like the tactical thing I was talking about with playing safe off the one ball. And we're going to do real progressive, forward thinking type things. It's not rebuild their stroke, naturally. you got to be a good player and you got to have good character. But it's tuned. Tune something and get them keen about it because they never like some of my players are actually surprised about stop shot speeds. And these are pro players, you know, and they're like, well, what? what's the difference? You know, it's, it's, it's one of these things we're all going to work together, we're all going to get on board, and we're going to build some unity. And I can't guarantee that we're going to win, but I can guarantee you we'll look disciplined and professional. I will guarantee you that, you know, no matter what happens. And maybe I'm not the captain next year. The captain is going to find the state of the sport in a much better place than what I got it in. I can tell you that too. So, yeah, because even if, even if they don't win, you you set a new standard that can just carry over right. from year to year, and they can just right. grow on that. We we desperately need to win, though. I mean, that's been emphasized and re-emphasized and re-emphasized because what happens is they won't be able to sell it to TV. They may have to go to no Europe and Asia. Yeah. That they got competition because right now there's probably you know three or four teams in Europe. They could just get five new players and still beat us. It and we won't usually lose as bad as we did last year with the players, but we're going to lose on average eleven to seven. I guarantee that. You know. They're just that much ahead. I mean, they're dramatically ahead. When you look at the professionalism that they bring and the attitude, and just like I was explaining about Ralph UK didn't flinch when it, he's playing a guy that hasn't missed a ball and played safety every single time where Ralph has no chance, and finally Ralph finally works his way into one little crack of light. Boom, gone. Because he planned for it, he worked for it, he designed that. You know, I mean, it's not. He doesn't get all upset. The Americans, they'd be so frustrated at that point. Four nothing down. The guy's not missing a ball, and you've never had one single shot in seven more innings. They're not going to be patient. They're going to try to win four games in one stroke. You know, the guys would be totally torqued off. Their mind would be semi disengaged. And if the shots cropped up just perfect, they could win. But Ralph took it. Yeah, you know, I mean, he, they didn't just crop up. He earned every bit and won decisively 11 7. I guess the guy really didn't make any mistakes thereafter. I mean, son of a gun, that's good pool. You know, I mean, I, I broadcast the match, took off my headset after I closed, walked downstairs, and ordered the match. You know, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so, and I watched a lot of matches too, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Are you going to uh, dissect a lot of the games that were lost? Like in last year's Moscone yes, Cup, yes, and go. Why yes. did we lose this game? Why? Right. What happened there? And even even this year, while we're out and you're doing these training matches, yeah, Tori, you won, but you played at 820. That really doesn't beat world right. class pool. I know you won right. this particular match, but 
and here's what happened. You blew four safeties, you know, and then you scratched on the brake twice. We, you know, it's just not good enough, you know. And right. so not, not to pick on them, just to say, we got to work here. We, we're right. not working hard enough, you know. And, right. and that way we can kind of quantify, and then also we're building up momentum for this year's Moscone Cup. Maybe we can get it back on TV. The pool awareness campaign is a big thing, you know. I mean, it, it sounds like nothing at first, but then after you reflect on it, and I think if we can see it through for a few more uh, years, I, I think it could mean something. Um, also, uh, there was a guy that came here specifically for um, what I just talked to him about pool. He's doing a research thing on pool, and and what he discovered was so interesting. And he was a real forward thinking. He's a real bright guy. And I was just asked to talk to him. I thought it'd be over with. He came back with some answers that were really forward thinking and well thought out, and something that could help pool too. And so. In the most of my industry, they stand around saying, eh, I wish there'd be another one of those good pool movies. That's what we need. Mm -hmm. And I mean, my God, wasn't that in the 80s? We had color. I mean, uh, we're, we're still pinning our hopes on Hollywood? I mean, come on. <laughs> it's 2014 here <laughs> and going. <laughs> so I think maybe, you know, maybe we should try to take something on our own and do something. And this is kind of. I'm actually uh, also considering myself the Johnny Appleseed method of promoting grassroots. Here's yeah. one little seed. Hopefully, these guys go on and become something. So, well, with social networking, you can reach a right. great number of people. Right, right. And that's why it's, it's urgent that we have a public Facebook presence. Right. Because all these guys can get on board and then their crowd followers, and then pretty soon it's kaboom, kaboom. We're getting, and then when we say we're coming to Memphis, Team USA will be in Memphis, and now they're going to be in Atlanta, and this is going to be cool, and we can meet the guys, and, and really help, you know, I mean, so, and this is a market that's palatable to anyone that has a TV product, but it's too hard to get, you know, and so, if, if we can kind of re-energize, you know, we can have a big build-up to this, then it's going to be better for our sport, too, you know, and this, I mean, it's just like winning on every front, and and then if we could win the thing just one time, you know, I mean, if we could ever just win one time, it would be absolutely explode the sport over here. Again, that, eh, not like that. It's not going to be Major League Baseball, I don't mean like right. that. And it's not skateboarding. It's not hot dog eating. Come on, it's not spelling bees. I mean, man, like, we, we deserve better than it somewhere, you know, I mean, it's not logging, chopping down trees. Well, if you go to a bookstore, pool is right next to, like, you know, checkers and backgammon. But it's not in the sports section, it's in the games. Yeah. So well, I think changing that image is important. Worse yet, when I'm publishing my book, you go to a bookstore, and there's a lot of bookstores that have zero books on pool, mm -hmm. and used to. But what's happened is the square footage costs so much, they can't afford to have a thing that, what, we're going to sell two this year? No, <laughs> get that out. No, we got to have things to turn over. You can't pay them all bookstore fees for that building and have something that sits there all year. It just doesn't work, you mm -hmm. know. And so that's why you will find zero to three pool books in any bookstore you go to. It's a rare bookstore today that you'll find more than that. Rare. Yeah. Very rare. I haven't found one in uh, two years. Yeah. But you'll find some that have zero books okay. open. But you won't find any that have more than, you know, I found, but I, I don't know how many I ever found. And sometimes they'll have three or four books, but it'll be the same book. You know, <laughs> they have diverse titles. You know, it's such a great sport. It just, yeah. And I remember even 20, 30 years ago, you go to a bookstore, there's quite a few. You get a pretty some. good selection. Yeah. Yeah. And now it's just the window, and like you said, sometimes none. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, and so that's why uh, my book is not in bookstores, it's unavailable. Because no one can get behind it. They did a real uh, good marketing study and thought that in maybe five or six years I could sell 2,000 copies. And they said it's, you know, just not going to sell enough for us to get behind it to put it in. Normally the smallest quantity they do for bookstores is 30,000 copies yeah. and then distribute them. And, and so that would be wonderful. And I was thinking about that, you know, that'd be great because, but they can't get behind it for 2,000 copies. Right. You know, I mean, it's just too slow, it's just, uh, no. And so, but the guy said, you know, Mark, you know, what you wrote is, is undoubtedly the finest instructional pool book out there, no doubt. And they said, no doubt about that, but we just can't get me, I mean, you'll sell some, you know, I mean, but, but no, we can't do it, it's just, it's, and this was a personal friend that's a big time publisher. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> he, he turned me down, I thought I was giving him something, you know, and uh, yeah, so for him to say no, I mean, it, it's for sure, and he knows his business, I mean, he's been in his whole life, and he, he recites exact numbers and stuff, and he just... Recently, Mark finished work on his book, Play Great Pool, and in my opinion, it's one of the best books ever written on the game of pool. 
And this is a must read for anyone who wants to learn the game of pool or anyone wanting to improve their game. So I asked Mark to tell us more about it. Okay, well, uh, when I was a young kid, I always wanted to write a book, and I didn't have any field of expertise, nor did I have any uh, writing skills. But after I got proficient in the sport, and I was always kind of like, boy, this seems like there's so much missing in terms of the uh, quality of the instructional narrative that maybe it's incumbent upon me because I've been blessed with good access to great information from the right people by almost pure happenstance. You know, and so I thought, well, then maybe I can do that. And then another time my father told me that you've never mastered a topic until you become capable of teaching it, which always made a lot of sense. And then I was also thinking about how when I was younger and wanted to learn, I was buying books and reading them and trying as best I could, but they were so vague that oftentimes I was uncertain that I was actually doing what I was supposed to be doing. And so uh, then somewhere between as near as I can figure 16 to 20 years ago, I took a paper and pencil and wrote this entire book. And it's now gone through many, many iterations of that. But I still have the original, which is, uh, I'd be ashamed to show anyone, but it was long, I can tell you that. And so, uh, we, then after that I got a, my first editor, and she made it quite a bit better, and uh, helped. And then I had yet a second editor, and once again I got upgraded, and then I got my third editor, which turned into my co-author, which intensified the whole thing and dramatically raised the bar, I mean, he probably improved it. I kind of consider it like this, and, and this might even be generous towards me. I contributed 55%, he contributed 45%, because he made it come alive and read well. And the problem for the previous two editors was that they didn't have the experience in the sport. He's had quite a deal, bit of lessons from me, he's very passionate about the sport. And then, on the other side, of it, he's a learned guy that has been published before, so he understands the writing process. And so, you know, the, it was like the perfect storm of things to happen. And so when he took it on, it was a 600 page manuscript, one side of each page. And he looked at it and he said, boy, that's interesting. Would you object if I took it home? And no one's ever expressed much interest in it but me. So I said, no, no. And so he went home and read the entire thing. back to this great big manuscript like this and he opened up to like page 532 or something and he says, look at this paragraph right here. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, look at this. I mean, read that. And I said, yeah. He said, you wrote that perfect. That is excellent. I don't think we're going to have to do one thing to that. And I've been working on it for uh, over 10 years at that point. And I thought, sort of I thought he was making a little joke, you know, but he wasn't. <laughs> and so then he thought when he started out that it would be, if we worked really hard five or six weeks, we'd really have this thing dressed up, which he put a girl through medical school and she graduated before we completed it, you know, so it ended up being five or six years. And not working feverishly, but a week per month for five or six years, which is about, a, that's a good dose too, by the way, when it's something that intense. And we've rewritten it, I don't know how many times, and thank goodness for him. And it was, it was kind of a funny thing where, had he known it was going to be this hard, no, had I known it was going to be this hard, I would have been embarrassed and never asked him to help. <laughs> I wouldn't have put that on him, I wouldn't expect it. Had, had he known, he would have never accepted. But thank goodness we didn't know, you know what I mean? It was, <laughs> It was the it's unknown, right? It's kind of like, I was reading this thing, success is when, uh, you know, ignorance and persistence are, are there. You know, then you can have success. And if you really know what you're getting into, you wouldn't even try it. And, and I learned my lesson, but good. There will not be a second follow-up book, I can promise you that. <laughs> well, it's, uh, you know, you could, it could be a never-ending process. And even as recently as a year ago, my wife had surmised that this would never be a real book, you know. And, and many of my friends, they would just laugh. They go, how's that book coming? And I go, oh, no, I think next year. Because <laughs> yeah, it had been so many years. Well, it was on my website, and I'd been working on it a long time then. It was listed as due out in 2003. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, missed it by a decade was all. That's yeah. all. I was pretty close. But anyway, but the bottom line is it wasn't written for money. It wasn't written about hurry up and get this out there or slop through it. it was, it's my legacy of the sport. I couldn't be prouder of it, and even today there's only a thousand copies of them, and even when I sell one it's kind of like, 
So what kind of a table do you have at home? You know, mm -hmm. and, uh, what's your handicap? I mean, it's like a guy is going to adopt my kid or something. I mean, I don't know. No, this goes to a good home. I, it's not that urgent for me to get rid of them. They're bought, <laughs> paid for. I, I love them. I, for a long time, I thought it was just going to be me and Doc that owned them. You know, I mean, and if nobody else liked it or got it or thought it was a crazy concept or anything, uh, I understand that. It's not. It's not an easy read. I mean, it's written in such a way that it's, it's not a bad read. It's not dry like a science book, uh, a technical book, you know, it's not like that. But you would have to be interested in the topic, and there's a vast majority of material on the uh, on each chapter, you know. And one guy said to me, boy, I'm really enjoying this, but I've never seen any book that had 7,200 words on stance, you know. <laughs> I had to laugh, because there is that much, you know, and I was thinking about it, and, and all the various iterations, and I, I found out that I, you know, I, I, I found out and, and made virtually every mistake to write a book that you could possibly. But so now I actually know much better about how to go about it. But whew, it's a lot tougher than I ever thought it would be. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, JTS Brown is uh, that's what the Paul Newman drank in the Hustler. Did you know that's the bourbon? Oh. JTS Brown. Uh -huh. It's a real obscure thing. And so I always thought it was fictional. So finally, I landed one bottle of this, and I had it on my shelf for I don't know six, seven years, just sitting there. Never. I don't drink, you know, or anything. So Doc and I, during the course of our studies and everything, we always thought how we would culminate this book. When we get this done, you know, even if nobody else loves it, me and you love it, you know, and we're going to celebrate this. So there's this one great steak place that I love, and he does too. So we're going there for a steak, and then that night we're going to crack that bottle of JTS Brown and each have a shot out of it. Just like a ceremonial, that's up. And so, so we did that. <laughs> that was our big thing. But and to this day, there's that much missing out of the bottle. I have no temptation to go back. If you've ever drank turpentine, <laughs> I think that would be the equivalent of my thing. But but nonetheless, uh, it was that was just our ceremonial thing. It's, and he didn't do it for money, and I didn't do it for money. It wasn't about that. And even though I spent a lot of time and money on it, it's it's. I want 50 years from now someone pick it up and say, "No, dang, this guy thought a lot about pool here." You know, this is pretty interesting. Yeah, because I've seen a lot of pool books, and they're nothing like. Your book. Well, the, the biggest thing. I mean, they're nothing that, like your book. I, I, I've told everybody that no matter what the material was, I wanted it to be good, of course. But the number one thing I wanted to be motivating and inspiring. Right. I wanted to so so you feel like, oh, okay, right, right. I can see I could get this, and everything is in there. It's it's kind of like here's not Mark's opinion, but here's the science behind it, the biomechanics and the physics of what needs to take place. Here's the practice exercises to get this. Here's the checkpoints to see that you're getting this. And then here's where to troubleshoot when you struggle, you know. So and each chapter is kind of written with that in mind, so it's 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 a complex subject, you know, to, to really do a good job of it. And so I wanted to make it as usable as I possibly could, as user friendly, and understand it's work. The, the the book is that's actually the cheapest thing that you have. You know, I mean the, everything else is expensive, doesn't require a great deal of time and effort. And so that's kind of how it got that way, but it's also an inspiring read. And as you go through it, you will find, you know, uh, even today, there's very few people that have read the entire thing. You know, even today, and it's been out for, you know, six months, six, seven months, probably something like that. But boy, there's a lot of material there.